So Bones and All is a movie that I've been waiting for with hungered anticipation. Yeah, we're making bad eating jokes, what of it? It's based on the 2015 book of the same name by Camille D'Angelo, and while there are a lot of similarities, the script for the movie definitely took certain aspects in a different direction. I saw great reviews for this coming out of Venice while I was at TIFF, and then a bunch of my friends saw it at the New York Film Festival. One of my friends literally described it as prestige Twilight. How did I not have a personalized invite to the world premiere? I watched it and it's a lot. And then I read the book and it's also a lot, but like in a different way. As I often do, I'll be comparing the two, uh, but I'll still be making sure to spend a like special focus on the movie for the people that are interested in that. I'm gonna lightly touch on some no spoiler thoughts I had about the movie. So as long as you know what the general premise is, you should be safe. And I'll let you know when we're gonna be diving into like going through the movie. But I honestly feel that a lot of people are gonna have a difficult time watching this. It isn't something that I'd initially lean into calling body horror, but when you go by the definition of disturbing violations against or of, of the human body, yeah, there are indeed some disturbing violations. So I'm gonna spoil the thing here. So if you have no idea what the thing might be and you are clicked on this video for some reason, like here's your warning, but yeah, it's a, it's a cannibal love story uh, to reduce it to its most basic foundation. Uh, and Luca gets damn into it at times. So just to clarify, they aren't cannibals out of any kind of necessity or lack of resources. Uh, this is just something that they're compelled to do and can't stop, though they can control it to varying degrees. The Timmy fans are really gonna have to flex how strong their stomachs can be and they should maybe consider rocking up with some earplugs because so much of this is in the sound design. Absolutely, a lot of it is in the visuals as well. They consulted people on what it would look like to uh, rip human flesh with human teeth, but the slurping and the crunching might be what gets to even even those with the strongest of stomachs. I don't think it goes overboard, but it does hit you a little bit hard and heavy out the gate and then kind of settles for a while. But honestly, what made me feel the most unwell was something involving human hair, so mileage may vary. I think it's beautifully shot. I love the aesthetics and the Midwest vibes. The fact that this isn't happening in some deeply different world or dystopian future, it's just a sliver of the past. A tiny piece of the world that would still exist right now that most people, if they're lucky, would never encounter. A world that these two people are so desperately trying to find a connection in and finally find it in one another. I think some of the script can get a little rough at times, but the performances out of the leads was super good. I also really loved his collected wardrobe of are these just things he found on his travels or things he's taken from victims. I wanted this shirt so bad only to discover that they most likely bought it from this exact Etsy listing. And I honestly think one of the best things I can say about this movie, regardless of how you end up feeling about it, is that it just has this very unique feel to its tone. I didn't love it as much as I thought I was going to, but I will say that I enjoyed it more more on my second watch. There are areas I feel like they could have been handled better and then some things that I preferred coming out of the book. But it does a really great job opening up this weird little world of outsiders amongst outsiders. And while you may not want to open your reality to these kinds of people, today's sponsor Surfshark can help open your virtual world. Surfshark VPN has thousands of different server locations all around the world that you can quickly connect to securely across all your devices with one account. This makes your internet think you're in a different location, allowing you to access region locked content. Content. Say you watch Bones and All and feel like you need a little bit of a light pick-me-up like The Office. Only to remember that you live in the US and it's not on Netflix anymore and you don't want to sign up for 15,000 different streaming services. All you have to do is connect to a Canadian server location and boom, Office for days. I'm constantly using it to watch things on streaming services that don't exist in Canada like Hulu and to access things on streaming services the US doesn't have while I'm traveling. So let's Surfshark open up your world today. It's super fast, secure, block someone it adds, and if you use code JEDI, you can save a whopping 85% off your subscription plus get three months free. And if that wasn't good enough, they offer a 30 day money back guarantee if you're not completely satisfied. So make sure to click the link in the description below to try out Surfshark for yourself. So on top of the quick note premise of Cannibals in Love, Bones and All also serves as this weird twisted coming of age story about outcasts finding each other and recognizing that on top of this very rare affliction, I suppose we'll call it, that they both share, there's also an understanding of themselves in the other. And depending on how much you engage with the cannibal aspect of this story is probably gonna depend on how you kind of walk away feeling about it. I know a lot of people aren't okay with the idea of cannibalism being used as a vessel for certain aspects of the story that might be getting conveyed to the audience. Because there's a lot of different ways you can take it. You can just kind of take it on the face value with two people committing disgustingly inhuman acts and the different ways that they engage with that part of themselves while they're also longing to belong and find their place in the world as they're past 
past lurk behind them. You can completely stop thinking about any ethics about cannibalism and just really focus on the consuming nature of love and how intense a bond can form between outsiders that have never felt at home in this world uh, and even be loved for the thing that outcasts them in the first place, even if that thing is eating people raw. Then of course there's the ethical considerations within the characters as a result of their actions. You can see it as cannibalism just being the most overt way to describe that someone is so completely different from most of the rest of the world, while still having that be a feeling that a lot of people have been able to relate to at different times in their life, though again, hopefully without eating people. Then you can kind of take it even deeper and see cannibalism as this stand-in for the things people deal with that feel impossible to escape or overcome. Things you might've been born with or develop and can cause outward damage, kind of like the big comparison here would be addiction. There also seems to be an examination of like queer culture and like sexual fluidity and the complicated emotions that that would leave someone feeling, but I don't know if a cannibal movie was where I really wanted to, to dive into that. More on that later though. Then the book, if you didn't know, uh, works as a pretty large statement against consuming meat, which you can also see a bit in the movie when they're at a slaughterhouse. Basically, this is a movie that invites you to engage with it in a variety of ways, and each of those ways can kind of present its own issues and challenges, and that's okay. I do think the book starts off like really, really interesting and compelling, but then the movie did a better job closing it out and connecting the themes that I feel it was going for. So let's hop into it. So if you want off the spoiler town ride, uh, now's the time to get. But we start our story off with Marin, a teenage girl who every night gets locked into her room from the outside and has her windows screwed shut. But tonight she manages to sneak out for a sleepover. And it seems to be going well. I picked up some vibes that this girl might have a little crush on Marin, uh, and then Marin bites her finger off. Yeah, that's right. We're just, we're just diving on in there. No idea why she did it in front of two other people. I just kind of assumed that it had been so long that she really couldn't control herself. It's it's fairly gruesome. She has to get pulled off by the friends, but then when she gets home, her dad doesn't even seem that shocked, just like frustrated and disappointed as if like she had just crashed a car for the third time. You didn't. And just like that, we are thrust into this weird reality. Marin eats people and her dad just carts her around the US hoping that she'd be able to contain it long enough for them to settle. But then on the day after her 18th birthday, she wakes up to her dad gone. I can't help you anymore. <laughs> I know it's not your fault. You were born this way. Leaving nothing but a cassette tape with a loose explanation of him not being able to handle this anymore. The idea that her mom is probably the same, which is why she left when Marin was born. Some cash and her birth certificate. In the book, it's flipped. For one, that sleepover scene didn't happen. She's just kind of progressively been eating boys from her class every time they move somewhere new. Uh, but it's the dad who left before she was born. And I kind of much prefer how that plays out in the book, which we will get to. And in the book, it's when she's 16, not 18, and instead of a cassette, all she gets is a short note that says, I'm your mother and I love you, but I can't do this anymore. And Marin's just left to fill in the larger meaning. I can't protect you anymore when it's the rest of the world that needs to be protected, but I also can't bring myself to turn you in. I feel like the movie upped her to 18 for a couple reasons. For one, it makes sense that a parent would stick it out until the child's a legal adult. Uh, two, Luca gets to dodge the underage age gap relationship aspect this time. And three, it's probably easier to make what she's doing more palatable if she's a little bit older. So instead of six 16 and 19, our leads are 18 and 21-ish, though I will say in the book, uh, they never actually like kiss. There's like one brief little moment of intimacy at the end, which we'll get to of uh, the movie filled with smoochin'. So Lee is gonna be slightly more experienced in this way of living, but still come across as this lost soul running from himself, which is something that Chalamet specifically wanted to express that wasn't really in the book. So through the cassette, we get some of the stories of the people she's eaten, how it started when she was a baby, happened again at a summer camp when she was eight. And I I think it works. There was just like this haunting, defeated nature of all this being narrated back to Marin by her father, like things she never remembered, things she'd rather forget. But the book is so compelling in the beginning because we have the benefit of being inside Marin's brain. She's the one telling us about all these things she's done and all the thoughts she had while she was doing it. Because in the book, it seems like she specifically targets people that are interested in her and seemingly justifies what she does to them mentally because they always end up wanting something from her in return. Not that they've specifically hurt her, but you know, like the childhood summer camp sweetheart that wanted to hang out with her in a tent when they were eight. Boys inviting her over to study when their parents weren't home, alluding to other desires. Except in almost all these situations, she's already mentally resigned herself to what she's going to do and still keeps choosing to do it. The only thing that falls outside this MO of who her victims end up being is that initial babysitter she ate as a child. It's like the only woman she's ever eaten. But the book literally starts with her describing the babysitter as someone who desperately wanted 
a baby of her own. So still technically someone who wanted something from her. Almost like Marin reasoned that out later in life to match how she's compartmentalized what she does. Even when that situation was just her dumb baby brain encouraging her to eat a person. And I really like that aspect of the book. I was a really big fan of the writing style, how Marin's thoughts are expressed, the things that disgust her about her actions, but also the reasons she continues it. So I feel like if they had introduced a light monologue from Marin earlier in the movie, that would have really added something for me. I realize that the movie's kind of expressing that Marin doesn't seem to fully remember what she's done, but I also don't like that angle. She's writing in a journal pretty consistently in the book, so that would have been a really easy way to uh, occasionally drop a little monologue. I realize that a large part of her journey in this movie is learning to see herself in her own way instead of through the lens of like her parents and the only other people she's known but it was just something that I loved about the book that I feel we lose here. So once she's accepted that her dad isn't coming back she heads out to find her mom and almost immediately on her journey she's approached by this very unusual man saying that he can smell that they're the same and invites her back to where he's staying. Since the smell is a large aspect of the book but the movie really just plays up the fact that they can smell each other to the point of tracking if they work hard enough. In the book it ends up being something that Marin recognizes after the fact, like that teacher whose breath smelled a little bit too much like Rotten Pennies one time. So this is Sully. He's a weird dude. Starts referring to himself in the third person. She quickly realizes that this isn't actually his home. And then he reveals the elderly woman on the verge of death. And he's just waiting for her to pass before chowing down. So this is the first time Marin's ever encountered someone like her. In a lot of ways, she assumed she was the only one. In the book, it specifically talks about how she'd spend all her time in school libraries looking up stories of cannibal society societies and books, printing out artwork that depicted it like Saturn devouring his son. So here she is on her own and the first person she encounters is like her. He also gives this really arbitrary you don't eat an eater rule, but it's like not really a thing. I think it's just establishing different rules that Sully has for himself. And as weird as Marin feels he is, she still ends up chowing down on Mrs. Harmon before sneaking off without him the next day. Look, sir, I'll eat a corpse with you, but I'll be damned if I hang around. The book is quite different here. She's actually invited inside by Mrs. Harmon to help with some groceries in exchange for money, but she also feeds her, says she can stay and have more food later after a nap. But there's this increased tension where we're just waiting for Marin to do something to this poor kind woman because she's told us that anytime she gets alone with someone, even if that person's being nice to her, she eats them. At one point saying that the main reason girls have been spared is because they don't want to be friends with her. But she doesn't. Mrs. Harmon actually dies of natural causes. Then Marin finds Sully eating her corpse. Apparently he could smell it from the street. And while he's also unsettling and weird in the book, she's not anywhere near as weirded out by him as she is in the movie. But in both, he has the thing that grossed me out the most. He takes the hair of the people he eats and weaves it into a rope, just one big giant rope. But then in, in the book explains that it's like making something lovely out of something that's done and gone. Which sure, but that's the thing that really started turning my stomach when I watched the movie. Look, I can tolerate cannibalism, but I absolutely draw the line at unkempt hair rope. He starts talking about different historical groups that ate their dead as a way to pass on wisdom to honor them. And he only eats people that are dead, which immediately makes Marin think of herself as a worse person because she just goes for their throats while they're alive and yeah. The book specifically paints them more ghoulish than cannibalistic because they just devour entire bodies in minutes. But unlike the movie where she sneaks off, much to his dismay, look, look at this creep, he's betrayed. He leaves her alone to make the decision on her own and decides she'd like to just try to find her dad on her own. Which is where in both she runs into Lee at a store. And the two instantly make note of each other. In both, Lee goes at a drunk that's harassing a woman and her child before goading him away to eat. And beyond the smell, Marin knows what Lee is because she she wanders out to him covered in blood, but in the book, she realizes that the guy disappeared and suddenly Lee is wearing his hat. And in the book, he confirms that she's one because he blatantly sees her eating some dude in a car. Just a guy that said he wanted to help her, but then kept making moves on her, locked the car door when she tried to leave, playing it up as concern for her. So she eats him. But hey, don't lock girls in your car and you might not get eaten. So going against everything they've known in life, the two join up and start their journey. While he still has a relationship with his sister, who they'll be detouring to see, he's on the run from something that he's done. And after some cheeky first time talks. Who's a babysitter? Mine too. 
they get tracked down by a couple of redneck cannibals, Stolberg shirtless Jake and David Gordon Green. And they just want to share some beers and trade hunting stories with fellow eaters before Jake tells them about getting to the point where you can completely eat a body, bones and all. At first I felt like this was a weird change from the book where once they're outside of infancy, they always eat the bones and all, which is definitely a factor in why cops don't constantly find them. But the movie is definitely alluding to the consuming nature of their story down the road. But the real shocker in this moment is that David's character here doesn't eat out of need. He's a cop who stumbled on Jake feeding and decided to join in, which horrifies Marin. For her, this is something she has to do. It's a part of her. It's tainted every piece of her life. So someone doing it just because they want to disgusts her. Fair emotion, but at the end of the day, you are both killing and eating people. She just so desperately wants to believe that she's different. I don't want to hurt anybody. Famous last words. So she storms off and Jake leaves Lee with an ominous message that Lee reminds him of every junkie he's ever known. He thinks he's got it all under control, but you pull one thread and he'll fall apart. You know, might have meant more coming from someone who's not shirtlessly wearing fishing waders. The idea of addiction is definitely something the cannibalism can align with. It's not for survival because they eat other food, but it's still a physical need. A different type of hunger that can be passed down to you from a parent and something that inevitably hurts the people around you. So they end up bailing on these two, mostly because they're weirded out and the movie makes it seem a lot more dire, but barely an inconvenience, still don't fully understand why he ran at them. They end up at a carnival where in the book, Sully shows up and invites them back to a cabin he has, or should I say a cabin he acquired. Bookly is immediately not a fan and rightfully weirded out by Sully tracking Marin halfway across the country. And I feel like they didn't really need to do that here because Marin was already unsettled by Sully in the movie and Lee had already expressed that he profoundly doubts Sully had good intentions. So in the movie, it's mostly just a carnival trip. So Marin says she's hungry and not for McDonald's. Okay, she didn't say that second part, that was me, but yeah. So in the movie that leads to Lee trying to scope out a victim of opportunity and finds a game booth worker being rude to a kid and decides, sure, this is the one I'll seduce. He'll definitely go for it because he's wearing a button up Mona Lisa shirt in the Midwest. In the book, it's a girl that worked at the booth and he decides to eat her because she's being rude to the kid and Marin doesn't join in. The meals are never shared in the book. But yeah, Lee's basically like Dexter except for the tiniest indiscretions. And I have some mixed feelings on that gender flip of like for some reason, it feels like they wanna add things on top but the cannibalism that would make these characters exist as outcasts. So we have the undertones of the sensuality with the girl at the beginning with Marin, which I've seen people compare to outing yourself in public situations. Lee's sister telling him his shirt makes him look like an F slur and then him immediately taking it off and it being the one piece of clothing you never see him wear again for the rest of the movie. But then he also has a tattoo that says Adam, Eve, and Steve. So like essentially confirming bisexuality. I feel like there's definitely some internalized homophobia going along with this, even with the tattoo. Uh, but that's like a rough avenue to explore alongside cannibalism. It just feels weird to have him pick out this guy he assumes is gay, getting him out to a field, starting to jerk him off from behind, then slitting his throat before he gets off. It she feels a little bit gross. Even as a callback to queer-coded monsters in media, it feels messy. It also really made the dynamic of their love and relationship feel weird when he's just doing sexual stuff with the guy while she's like right there like, you don't need to play with your food, Lee. That's just one of those things where I can equally see how you can take something positive out of it or not be a fan. Either way, Marin joins in and they do the usual thing where they try to see if that person's house is empty only to find that he had a girlfriend or wife and kids, which messes Marin up. Killing someone was mostly fine to her, but finding out that that guy had a family waiting for him is just way more upset. And then she's also upset that Lee isn't more upset, which all makes her start to question her actions more, which definitely feels like a departure from the book where Marin is still bothered by the things she needs to do, but she's also always talking herself into her actions. As mentioned in the book, Marin seems to eat people that are interested in her. And as much as she wants to be loved or at least liked, she'll keep doing what she does. Though it's interesting in the book that the killing seems to bother her a lot more when it's done, but in the movie, the dad specifically tells us that she wasn't super upset by killing her camp friend at all. But in the movie, she now seems like the one with the stronger moral compass when it comes to 
eating people. And by contrast, Lee seems to eat out of anger in a way that Marin in the book frames as eating people the world would be better off without. Ah yes, the girl working at the carnival who denied a kid a prize, the real menace of this story. Around here, Marin manages to find her grandmother who lets her know that her mom institutionalized herself years ago and seems quite aware of what her daughter is. In the book, this whole exchange is a lot more sad. They had adopted Marin's dad after the death of their son and essentially saw him as a replacement. But maybe they should have thought a little bit more about adopting the kid who was found under traumatic circumstances? Bitch in origin story though, her dad got kidnapped by a predator who brought him to a rest stop bathroom to do some stuff with him, but he ate him instead. And I much prefer how the hospital situation played out in the book compared to the movie. Mainly because I feel it's genuinely more horrifying in a particularly bleak way. Her dad's so medicated that he can't speak, but before he got this bad, he started writing a journal for his child in case they ever came to see him. And it's tragic talking about how he thought he could keep Marin's mom, Janelle, safe and out of his eating, but she ended up walking in on him in the act and he could never convince her that he wouldn't hurt her or the baby. So before Marin was even born, he left and checked himself into an institution so he wouldn't be a danger to anyone. Because he never considered the scenario that this is something that he would have passed on to his child. He was adopted. He didn't know his real family. And when he realized that was a possibility that his own child could suffer, maybe kill Janelle, it broke him and he chewed his own hand off. And he only found out that there were others in all different walks of life in major positions of authority because he let one of the orderlies read his story. That guy believed it and thought finding others might help if he knew he wasn't alone. That orderly Travis though, particularly weird. After finding everything out, all he wants is for Marin to eat him. He's this very lonely guy that's very bitter that no one's wanted him in life and got fixated on the idea of being eaten as his exit. That character's omitted from the movie. In the movie, Marin's mom has a letter for her, but she's chewed off most of both of her arms. But the letter basically says that if Marin ever found her, it's because she ended up the same way, that the world of love wants no monsters in it, so she wants to fix the mistake she brought into this world. But then she tries to eat her to stop the cycle. Yeah, that's right, they brought Chloe in just to gnaw some teeth. So she gets away and it leads into a huge argument between her and Lee about what they do, the ethics of their very existence and the self-loathing that comes from it. But Lee says it's their nature and it's something she's gonna have to adjust and square away, Otherwise, the options are, you know, lock yourself up like your mom or off yourself. But she wants to believe that there's another way. Man, when the world no longer has grave space and it's seen as too detrimental to burn bodies, these people will thrive. What is wrong with me? So after not being able to square away the ethical debate, she ends up leaving Lee in the truck to go off on her own. But then Sully finds her and thankfully Movie Marin is appropriately disturbed that he's tracked her down and specifically waited until Lee wasn't around to approach her. I wish I had the clip of him saying life's never dully with Sully. So even though he was the one who said it wasn't safe to hang around other eaters, he's decided that he doesn't want to be alone anymore and Marin is his choice of partner. And he is super not happy that she doesn't agree with that. Calls her a C word that even I, a woman, cannot say lest I be age restricted, but it rhymes with hunt. The delivery is quite funny while also being terrifying because we know this man can find her across great distances and uh, doesn't seem to be the most stable. So she decides she'd like to get back to Lee. She destroys the tape from her dad, abandons the letter from her mom, and says goodbye to her past, which I assume is her finally deciding to view herself on her own terms. And Lee wasn't doing too great, crying on the phone to his sister, nightmares of his past, so he finally tells Marin why he left home. His dad was abusive, ended up hitting his sister Kayla, so when she went to get the cops, his dad tried to eat him, so Lee beat him to the punch. The muffled breathing that we hear that turns into horrified muffled screaming is the sound of his dad being eaten while taped up. But what seems to affect him the most is how much he enjoyed it in that moment. And that if it wasn't for his sister, he probably would have offed himself. In the book, I think it's a little bit more horrifying. He used to eat the abusive guys that his mom brought around. And one day his girlfriend saw it happen and it messed her up so bad she's been in a hospital ever since. Obviously no one believed her that she saw Lee eat a man whole, but he's haunted by literally destroying this person he loved life. But then we get to the crux of it. You don't think I'm a bad person. All I think is that I love Marin doesn't engage with the question because it doesn't matter to her. Objectively, yes, you eat people alive, you're a bad person, not necessarily because of what you did to your dad, but that's not what this moment's about. It's about the acceptance and the love that they have for each other despite all of the things that they've done. So yeah, very much like Twilight, Edward's saying he's killed people, but Bella doesn't care, except in this scenario, Bella's also draining bodies. But it's in this moment that they decide to be people for a while. I don't know if that's just making the decision to stay in one place or doing that and trying not to eat people, but it's cute. 
for a bit. Honestly, would have loved to see more of the movie dedicated to this time of their life. Maybe then I truly feel the romance. But obviously Sully tracks her down, still super upset, and while he says he doesn't mind that she doesn't like him, definitely don't believe that. He's basically implying that he's going to kill her for knowing too much about him, but then just kind of starts laying on her. Almost like, be with me and I don't have to kill you. At this point, he's wearing these little postal delivery looking shorts with the spittle dripping down his mouth, and it's truly just an entire vibe. But Lee gets back, it turns into a scuffle and for people who literally spend most of their life killing other people quickly, this took so long. Marin stabs him repeatedly and he still doesn't go down until she like pulls out his intestines. <laughs> then a lot happens fast. Marin realizes that Sully probably killed Lee's sister, then realizes that Lee got stabbed in the lung. Lee realizes that it's Kayla's hair at the bottom of Sully's rope and repeatedly starts asking if he's a bad person before begging Marin to eat him. In the book, it's a little muddy, but it almost feels like a request he made in full health or at least something that he lets happen. Up until this point in the book, they've never slept too close to each other, they've never kissed, but this time after killing Sully, he gets close to her in bed and her stomach crumbles. He keeps talking about how he knew this would happen the first time they connected eyes, and I'm not sure if he meant like they would fall in love or if she would eat him, but him wanting her to would feel weird because of how devoted he is to being around for his sister, who in the book wasn't killed. But if it's just something he ended up letting happen because Marin started eating him once he got to close, I could see that as the expression of this total devotion to an all-consuming love, and his more selfless view of it while her engagement with intimacy always escalates. The movie really seems to amp up this all-consuming side of it. He knows he's dying and wants to give himself to her completely, to be seen in love for all that he is, that he can be a part of her in his death. And it's kind of left to the audience interpretation if she consumes him, bones and all. You know, kind of the play on I'll take it warts and all. And I feel pretty confident that she did. Not because she couldn't stop herself or wanted to, but because he begged her. So in the movie, it feels like Sully is that representation of selfish love while what they have as a unit is more selfless. And the last shot of this movie is just us seeing them one more time back in that field the moment they decided to live like people. And it's super bleak. She's just gonna go on living her life, presumably alone, having eaten the one person who ever fully understood her. And we just have to wonder what she'll do next. Also, the song that Trent Reznor is singing at the end of this is just so poignant. For a minute, it made it feel like home. The book unfortunately goes on for a good chunk after she eats Lee. She keeps working at the university library and then ends up eating a student that had just been like progressively showing more interest in her. So in this, we're kind of left knowing that any humanity Marin had died with Lee. Then ends it off as what can only be described as a cannibal girl boss line. He stepped into me and ran his tongue along the edge of my jaw. I had no idea you were so twisted. I sighed as I pressed my lips to his neck. Nobody ever does. <laughs> Ma'am. Making the whole thing significantly less bleak because Marin should be dead. In terms of other big changes in the book, Sully is actually Marin's grandfather. And he seems to have a thing for eating family members. And because he could never get to his son, he's gonna eat Marin instead. He was just like, playing around with her a bit beforehand, like fattening her up. Obviously stretching the truth on what only eating dead people means to him. And I think I much prefer Sully as this random eater trying to make a connection with someone without taking their desires into account. Lee ends up killing a university student that's rude to Marin and that's where they're squatting at the end of the book. It's like much less cute. Marin writes a letter detailing all the people she's killed and plans to send it to the cops someday, but changes her mind after seeing her father in the institution. There's a few other small things, but yeah, uh, I don't love the movie as much as some people do. I do appreciate a lot more about it the more I've been thinking about it. And I do think that so much of the book is interesting, especially Marin's thoughts, but it just really ends up losing direction towards the end. So is this Prestige Twilight? In a lot of ways, Yes. Sadly, it'll never be as artistically masterful. But hey, you can dream, Luca. But yeah, let me know what you guys are thinking down below. I've been seeing so many different thoughts about this. There are so many angles that people are looking into it. So many things that people are drawing from it. Some people just hate it. If you've both read and watched it, let me know how your thoughts differ there. But thank you all so much for watching. Thanks as always to my Patreon supporters and YouTube channel members. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Leave a like on the video if you're into that kind of thing. All my social medias are listed down below. I hope you're all having a fantastic day. I'm mostly okay, and we'll catch you all later.